Welcome back to the Bible Reading Challenge podcast. My name is Aaron Ventura, and in this episode, we're going to look at First and Second Chronicles. You can find a written version of this episode along with outlines for each book over at localchristendom.com. And if you have questions or other feedback, you can email me at aaronventura at gmail.com or using the message box on the website. In the Hebrew Bible, First and Second Chronicles are one book. We don't know who the chronicler was, but some have identified him as Ezra the scribe. One of the reasons for this is that the last verses of Chronicles and the first verses of Ezra are essentially the same. Both record the decree of Cyrus, king of Persia, to go up and rebuild God's house at Jerusalem. We might call Ezra Nehemiah Third Chronicles because it continues the story of God's house as it was rebuilt by the Jews. First Chronicles begins with Adam, the first man, and Second Chronicles ends with Cyrus, the Lord's Messiah. And at the center of Chronicles is the reign of Solomon and the construction of the temple. This is what the history of the world from Adam to David is meant to lead up to. And it is what the whole of human history is all about. God coming and dwelling amongst his people, making them into a house for his name. Chronicles sets up and anticipates the incarnation of God in the man Christ Jesus. So as you read through these lists of names and cycles of kings and their reigns, allow it to stir up in you that narrative tension that finds its fulfillment in the birth, coming, and reign of Jesus Christ. Chronicles gives us context for the greatest event in human history. Chronicles spans about 3,480 years from Adam unto Cyrus, and of all the things that God could have told us about that time, this is what he has chosen to give us. The question we should ask here is, why? What is so important about all these names and genealogies? Is this information really necessary? I would have liked to know a lot more about dinosaurs, for example. But this is what God has chosen to give us. And it's when we come to these sections of scripture that we need to remember what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What this means is that we cannot actually be complete, whole Christians without the book of Chronicles. There is something here, even in these genealogies, that will be beneficial for our growth in Christ. It is just a matter of us searching these treasures out. Now, in our English Bibles, the book of Chronicles comes after the book of Kings, and you may have wondered, Uh, Didn't I just read all this stuff? Why am I being told this all over again? So what's the difference between Kings and Chronicles? Well, one of the major differences is that Kings tells the history of both Northern and Southern Kingdoms, whereas Chronicles focuses almost exclusively on the Southern Kingdom of Judah. So Kings will contain lengthy sections describing the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. There are lots of prophets involved, but Chronicles has far less prophetic activity. Uh, You may also notice that that Chronicles omits certain things like uh, some sins of David while highlighting others. So for example, in 2 Samuel, what is David's great sin? Well, it's his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. But in Chronicles, David's great sin is taking a census, 1 Chronicles 21. And you may wonder, why was this census such a sinful action? Well, because according to the law, Exodus 30, taking a census was a military action that required atonement. It was a mustering of the troops wherein each man had to give half a shekel to the Lord to cover, that is, atone for, the necessary bloodshed of battle. Peter Lightheart has pointed out that this census is kind of like David's sin with Bathsheba, but on a national scale. So in 2 Samuel 7, David seizes the wife of a single warrior. But in Chronicles, David seizes the host and bride of Yahweh and treats it as if it were his own. He also bypasses the Levites who were essential to the preparation for war. You could read about that in Deuteronomy 20. So this focus on the priestly aspect of Israel's history is a major theme and element of Chronicles. So we might say that Samuel and Kings is the history of Israel from a prophetic perspective. And then Chronicles is the history of Israel from a Levitical or priestly perspective. And this is even evident in how the genealogies in Chronicles emphasize the priestly line. So for example, the tribe of Levi is structurally at the very center of the first nine chapters of genealogies. 
So let's walk through what is going on in these genealogies and just kind of summarize these first nine chapters. So the first chapter, we're going to go all the way from Adam unto Abraham. And if you remember God's promise to make Abraham the father of many nations, well, this is the fulfillment of that. We've got Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Esau, and they beget other chiefs and kings upon the earth. And just as a side note, there's a good chance that the Jobab here, who was king of Edom, is the same righteous Job that you read about in the book of Job. So there's also uh, helpful information like that scattered throughout. Uh, in chapters two to four, we are given the very messy but royal line of Judah. We see David and Solomon all the way down to Zedekiah and Zerubbabel. And this genealogy is super important for establishing the divine right of Jesus to inherit the throne of David. Remember that the first verse in the New Testament, Matthew 1.1, is a new genesis, a new genealogy. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Matthew is connecting itself to Chronicles in the very first verse of the New Testament. So the fruitfulness of Adam, the fruitfulness of Abraham and David, it all has a specific telos, a goal, an end in mind. And that is the fulfillment of God's promise to Eve, the first woman, that one day her seed would crush the serpent's head. And of course, in Christ, that day of victory has come. Now, after the royal tribe of Judah, we are given the lines of Simeon, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. And 1 Chronicles 5, 1-2 gives us some insight into the logical ordering of these genealogies. The chronicler says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. Yet Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Joseph's. So this is the background to the rivalry between Judah and Ephraim. So Ephraim is one of Joseph's sons. And when the kingdom was divided after Solomon's death, Judah and Benjamin remained together under Rehoboam. Uh, Jerusalem kind of straddles the territory of Judah and Benjamin, while the other uh, 10 tribes followed Jeroboam, the Ephraimite. And you can see that in 1 Kings 11.26. So, Ephraim eventually becomes shorthand for the whole northern kingdom of Israel. And there is a long conflict between these two brothers, these two kingdoms. However, Isaiah prophesies that one day the enmity between these rival brothers will come to an end. The envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. Isaiah 11:13. So one of the marks of the Messiah is that he will rise from the root of Jesse and bring together not only these scattered tribes, but the Gentile nations as well. So Chronicles gives us context for this future reunion of brothers that will take place in Jesus Christ. In chapter 6, we come to the center of these genealogies, and we have the priestly line of Levi. From there, we then move back out in chapter 7 to the peripheral tribes of Issachar, Benjamin, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, and Asher. And then chapter 8 gives us the other royal tribe of Benjamin. That's where Saul came from. And then chapter 9 gives us Israel after the exile, with a special focus on the priestly work at Jerusalem. We then move backwards in time to the death of Saul and the beginning of David's reign at Hebron. And that is where the narrative of Chronicles is going to begin. Now, if you take a step back and look at the way these genealogies are organized, there is a clear intentional focus that the chronicler is trying to give us. And it is, of course, the Levites, the priesthood, the musicians. And then surrounding it, kind of like the tabernacle was surrounded by the tribes in the wilderness, that's what you see here. So you've got uh, Simeon, Reuben, Gad, Manasseh on one side of the Levites. You've got Issachar, Benjamin, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Asher on the other side. And then they are bookended even more by a royal tribe. So Judah's on one side, Benjamin is on the other. And so it is saying something about the way that God is organizing society with worship at the center of it. And then the, the kingly tribe, the role of the king, is to protect that worship. All right, well, let's break down and summarize the rest of the book because there is, of course, a lot of chapters here to cover. So we're going to break it up into a few sections here. First Chronicles 10 to 21 record the reign of David, and it focuses on the Ark of the Covenant and its eventual relocation to Zion. 
Then, in 1 Chronicles 22 to 29, we are given his preparations for the temple. And this focuses on a new administration for the priests, the musicians, the gatekeepers, and other Levitical duties. Throughout the entirety of 1 Chronicles, it is the house of God that is structurally central. Everything else exists to protect, support, and build up the worship of God. By studying this organizational structure of Israel at this time, there are a lot of insights that we can gain into how we could possibly organize a Christian society today. There are lots of lessons for how both church and state interact, how civil and ecclesiastical offices can work together, and you see that the goal of all of this is to defend and promote the true worship of the triune God. And in this sense, Chronicles is a sort of manual for reformation. It is a a worship manual for God's people. When kings go bad and priests are unfaithful, the people suffer under God's judgment. But when the king, the magistrate, is righteous and the priesthood, you know, pastors, when they are faithful, God is magnified throughout the earth. And you see this pattern all throughout Chronicles. Joyful music, the sacrifice of praise, is the reason why these cities and nations exist. As the Westminster Catechism says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And this is the message of First Chronicles. Moving into 2 Chronicles from chapter 1 all the way to the end in chapter 36, we get the reign of King Solomon up until the decree of Cyrus. In the first nine chapters, we get the construction and dedication of the temple. This culminates with a visit from the Queen of Sheba. That the temple would be a house of prayer for all the nations, like Jesus said it was supposed to be, is experienced and fulfilled in Solomon's day. We are told that all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. This is a foretaste of what John describes at the end of Revelation. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. That's Revelation 21, 24. So the kingdom of Christ is what Solomon's kingdom and the glory of that kingdom pointed to, a time of peace and prosperity and wisdom for the whole people of God. Now it is not long after we hit this apex of Israel's glory under Solomon's reign that things start to go very bad. And the rest of the book from chapters 10 to 36 record this time period that is very similar to the time period of the Judges. And the Chronicler actually uses very similar language to the book of Judges to describe this time. So there is this cycle in Chronicles of faithfulness, that is followed by idolatry, which is followed by oppression at the hands of their enemies, which is followed by repentance, which is followed by God raising up a new faithful king to bring about reformation. But then, of course, that faithfulness does not last very long and the cycle repeats. One of the ways the chronicler tracks this progress is by noting the status of the building materials in the house of God. So when Judah is in a downward sin cycle, the gold and silver articles are taken from the temple. And when they are in a time of reformation, the house of God is built up, it is restored. So the temple is a visual symbol of God's people. When they worship idols, their glory devolves from gold to lesser metals like bronze. You can see that in 2 Chronicles 12. And eventually, this devolves all the way down to fiery dust and ashes. So just as the judges were replaced by Davidic kings, now the Davidic kings are replaced by Gentile kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, etc. So Chronicles closes with the temple in ruins, the Jews in exile, and the land having Sabbath rest for 70 years. But this is not the end of the story. Cyrus declares a great commission to go up to Jerusalem and rebuild God's house. And that is where 3rd Chronicles, or what we call Ezra Nehemiah, will pick up the story. Well, that is a brief overview of the book of Chronicles. If you have questions, please do reach out. And until next time, keep on reading.